Holmes. I'm one of the business development managers at Arcturus, uh, the penetration testing arm of the Cyberfort group. So we are fully Czech and Crest accredited penetration testers, um, really specialising in the field of application testing uh, and want to, you know, we're, we're striving to be the best uh, application penetration testers in the UK. And on that front, one of the things that we help our clients do is really uh, reduce the development life cycle of applications and securing their security. As part of that, we host uh, quite regularly secure coding workshops and training on the security of um, you know, what we find uh, when we do the uh, penetration tests. So we can train up your developers to better understand the, uh, the security and the things that we find. Uh, as part of that, we are running this series of uh, little webinars on some of the subjects that we cover during those workshops. And today we've got Products, who is going to talk about fuzzing and how that uh, give a lot of bang for your buck, uh, from what I can understand. So over to you, Rory. Thanks for the introduction, Ross. And yes, this is gonna be a presentation called Fuzz All The Things, with apologies to F-Secure, because I forgot that I stole their title. <laughs> so let's jump straight into it. As I said, this is Fuzzle the Things, and I'm Rory, also going by Rux. So, first of all, a bit about myself, a bit of background on me. My name is Rory, my main handle is Rux, by which you can find me mostly bothering people on Twitter and various other places online. I also head up the research division of Arcturus. You can find us over on labs.arcturus.net. I've been involved and interested in security for a fair while now. I started off in school hacking v and forums and keeping friends off of video games. In a more professional sense, I'm from a development and system administration background. Nowadays with Arcturus, I spend most of my time hacking on web apps, but my main interest is in vulnerability research and exploitation techniques. As a happy coincidence, Fuzzing is a topic that covers both. In this talk, we're going to cover the following few points. Firstly, for the uninitiated, I'm going to introduce the concept of fuzzing, what it is, where it came from, and the core concepts involved. Then we're going to talk a bit about some common fuzzing techniques and how they're used in practice in the real world, finding real bugs. We're also going to touch on some fuzzing tools you can use, some helpful resources, and round off with some open-ended ideas on how you can incorporate fuzzing into your own workflows. Let's clarify a couple of things before we begin. This talk is targeted primarily at developers, engineers, red teams, and just about anyone else involved in your tech stack. While this is going to be a fairly high level overview, you're going to get the most out of it if you fit into one of the above categories. Doesn't mean you should dial off if you're not though. As long as you're interested, then hang around. So, start off with, what is fuzzing? Let's talk about what it is. To put it simply, fuzzing is another method of software testing, a method of finding bugs in programs. But software testing sounds boring, so we're gonna keep calling it fuzzing. It's generally defined as a method of providing randomized, invalid input to programs and seeing if they break or do anything unexpected. That's it. That's pretty much the core concept you can dial off now. Buzzing your programs is useful because it can quickly give you an idea of how robust they are and help you find critical bugs. Now, the etymology of where the word fuzzing comes from is disputed, but the idea has been around since at least the 50s. Back in the days of punch card software, developers would often test their programs on these huge massive mainframes by feeding them random stacks of cards pulled from the rubbish just to see how their programs behaved. While this wasn't really done with a sense of security in mind because there weren't really many networks back in those days, it's still an example of feeding random input into programs to see how they behave. But nowadays, with computers being all modern and digital and automated, as an automated solution, fuzzing is a very low effort and high impact method of finding bugs in programs. Something near 80% of 
of all software bugs in Microsoft products, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Edge, Word, Office, you name it, and most other software you use day to day, and now found using some sort of fuzzing techniques. 80%. Now, I know I said low effort, but while fuzzing doesn't have to be a complicated process, as with most parts of life, you'll get out largely what you put in. You are not going to find crashes in Chrome by throwing random, unstructured junk data at it. Or at least, if you do, <laughs> don't quote this. In this field, there's quite a bit of terminology we have to cover. Otherwise, what I'm just going to say is going to sound like a lot of gibberish to quite a lot of you. Now, Wikipedia tells us that fuzzers can be generation or mutation based, smart, dumb, white, black, and several shades of gray. Fascinating. But what does it mean? To start, fuzzing can be used in both white box and black box settings. White box fuzzing typically refers to situations where the source code of the target program is available. This allows for easy introspection into program state and easier methods to intimate the, ins the resulting program. Black box naturally refers to the opposite. To give a more concrete example, most fuzzers targeting Apache, MySQL, Nginx will be white box because the source code is available, which makes it easier to develop fuzzers for these programs. Whereas, on the other hand, Fuzzers targeting programs like Microsoft's IIS or Word or Adobe Reader are typically black box because you don't have the source code available to easily inspect the program state. Now, as you may guess, there isn't necessarily a hard and fast line between these two. There is also a middle ground, which is rather unimaginatively known as gray box fuzzing. This refers to situations where some visibility has been added to otherwise black box programs using techniques like dynamic binary instrumentation. This is where you inject your own code into an otherwise black box executable to try and help you figure out what it's doing. Ultimately, what fuzzers do is provide input to programs, and there are a lot of ways to do that. And each one, helpfully, is called a different thing. So to help explain it, we'll take an example. Let's say you're fuzzing a PDF parser either your own or perhaps you're hoping to find some juicy zero days in adobe reader good luck if your fuzzer is only feeding the program random unstructured data you're probably not going to find any bugs probably apart from the fact that reader has been fuzzed to death and back most of the time random data isn't going to look like a pdf file so adobe reader frankly won't bother processing your junk data meaning you will miss large areas of code that could hold bugs Blindly throwing random data at programs like this is what's known as dumb fuzzing, because it has no knowledge of the program it's fuzzing. The fuzzer will just give it random data. As you can see, some easy examples of dumb fuzzing are just piping random data into various programs. Fuzzing isn't necessarily a binary tool. You can use fuzzing with APIs, anything really. The concept is the same. Now, Despite the unfavorable name of dumb fuzzing, this is actually a great place to start when testing your own software. Writing a dumb fuzzer should pretty much be your hello world into the realm of fuzzing, definitely your first port of call. Most of all, because it still finds bugs today in real world programs. But as I said, there are many ways to pass data to programs. If we go back to our example, we're gonna realize, sadly, the passing totally random and unstructured data is not going to get as many zero days in Adobe Reader. No Zerodium payout for us. So what can we do? What about if we adapt the fuzzer to produce almost valid PDF files? What if we took a large amount of real PDF files, played with the data in those, and then fed it to the program? Because we're now coming from a starting point of already having valid data, this technique is often far more effective than simply feeding random data into programs. This technique is what's known as mutation-based fuzzing and is one of the most common techniques used today. The phrase mutation-based originates in the fact that you are mutating input data of otherwise already valid programs. You're not generating the data yourself. To pick an example, the fuzzing tool Radamsa has found hundreds of security critical bugs in widely used software, despite only acting as a simple mutator. Take note though that the fuzzer still doesn't know about the program it's fuzzing. Redampster will just mutate the input and pass it to the program you're testing. 
it doesn't know whether you're targeting a web browser, a PDF reader, or anything else. It's just playing with the bytes and then sending it through. So in a sense, this can still be looked at as dumb fuzzing because a fuzzer still doesn't have knowledge of the program under test. So I'm now going to attempt to show you what this looks like in practice. If the demo gods will let me bring this up correctly. Ross, can you see this new screen I've got on my laptop here? I can. Fabulous. So here we're just going to simply demonstrate what I mean by dumb fuzzing. To give the example we had earlier, we're just simply going to pipe some data from dev random. So we just got a load of random data here and feed it into a program like unzip. And as we said before, unsurprisingly, this file is not being recognized as a zip file. So if we make a test file here, we now have an actual valid gzip file. And if we use Redamsa on this test file, we can actually see that gzip will actually accept this as a valid gzip file and attempt to work on it as such. See, we're getting a lot of different errors and error messages here. So to actually show you in a much more simple fashion what's going on, oops, we're just going to pretend our program has the input of hello world. Very simple, nothing's going to go on there. If we pipe this input through the program Redamsa, which again is just a mutator, we can see what happens here. We can see that Redamsa will choose any number of ways to mutate this input data, which is then going to be passed to our program. Of course, the mutations are random, but oftentimes if you will save the particular seed of what's generated this random data, you'll be able to recreate that fuzz case and replay that crash in order to find out how to fix your program. And so we could just keep running this, or if we go back to our file here, we can just keep running this until we eventually see a crash. But gzip in particular has been fuzzed quite a lot by Redamsa, and it's found a lot of bugs in the program. So we're just going to leave that running just for fun in the background while we go back to the presentation. So moving on, slightly more terminology. So what we've seen are example of dumb fuzzers. So how do we get smart? How can we increase our chances of actually finding some bugs, of getting those thousands of pound payouts from Zerodium for our sweet bugs in Adobe Reader? What we need to do is to make a smart fuzzer. A smart fuzzer is defined as a tool that has knowledge of the input format required by the program under test. This means off the bat that these tools are going to be very target specific. I mean, you're not going to throw a PDF fuzzer that generates PDF files at a JPEG decoder. Or if you do, you shouldn't expect anything to happen. This is also where the time and effort trade-off begins to come into play. Making smart fuzzers takes a lot more time and a lot more effort than just simple mutators. But as a result, they will often lead to much more high quality, deep bugs. To put it another way, dumb fuzzers are target agnostic, but smart fuzzers are not. Fuzzing and a lot of other software testing techniques are often used in combination with other mechanisms to improve results. For example, a common theme in fuzzers today is feedback driven fuzzing. What this means is that after a fuzzer has provided a test case to a program, it will then observe how that program treats that file. It will gather feedback. In the most common scenario, fuzzers will observe how much code coverage any given test case generates. This feedback is then fed into the test case generation algorithm. And over time, this allows the fuzzer to generate a suite of test cases that will cover as much of the program as it's able to do so. This is what fuzzers aim for because they are based on the principle that the more code you hit, the more likely you are to hit a bug. So if you have a test case that you're supplying to your mutator 
that covers almost every part of the program, you're going to be much more likely to hit those very edge case bugs. And while this isn't a perfect approximation of more code is more bugs, the pioneering tool in this space, AFL, has alone found thousands of critical bugs. Now, there are other more advanced topics in this space, quite a lot, actually. It's still a very active area of research. I'm not going to do a deep, in-depth dive about anything else in this talk, but be sure to check out the work being done by people like Gamozo, EQV, Dominic, and the people running the AFL++ team. And there's a lot of work being done in snapshot fuzzing in this space as well. Now, when I said I'm not going to do an in-depth dive, I'm going to talk about a particular story about the capabilities of feedback-driven fuzzing. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about AFL. AFL stands for American Fuzzy Lop, which is named as such because it has fuzzy in the name, but everyone just calls it AFL. So anyway, Michal Zalewski is a white hat ex-Google hacker. He's known for being the original author of the AFL program. Now, back in 2014, so this is a field that's actually been worked on for quite a while, in a blog post talking about AFL's capabilities, he stumbled upon an interesting point. AFL is actually able to figure out the JPEG file format based on feedback alone. So he literally ran the AFL tool with junk data and based on the feedback taken from the program he was fuzzing, which was a JPEG decoder, AFL was able to figure out how real JPEGs look. And what you can see on the slide here are some of the JPEGs that AFL was actually able to produce based on random data and then turn that random data into real JPEG files. That by itself is quite amazing, and it was generated a lot of press when this actually came out. AFL is able to do this because it instruments the program being fuzzed. It's pretty much the first widely used tool, at any rate, that allows researchers to compile a program with functionality to easily pass code coverage information on the fly to the fuzzing tool. So AFL is actually in two parts. There's a compiler and there's the fuzzer. In order to use the fuzzer, you have to have the source code to compile it with the instrumentation built in. That's the core of how AFL works. And so while that's quite an impressive feat just by itself, after figuring out the file format, AFL was also able to generate JPEGs that crashed almost every single image decoder at the time. There is a really good reason that AFL is so prolific. So why should you be interested in fuzzing? In case I haven't mentioned it enough times, fuzzing is a super effective method of finding bugs in programs, often including very security critical bugs as well. On the screen here is just a tiny amount of the many bugs that AFL has found in major widely used programs. People like Google and Microsoft spend thousands of CPU years a day fuzzing their own software trying to shake out bugs. Google run the OSS fuzz program which continuously tests about 200 core infrastructure programs against a large suite of customers and fuzzers. This program is running 24 seven all day, every day. And unsurprisingly, it produces vast amounts of bugs. Shown on the screen here is one of other Google's other projects called Syscaller, which is running on OSS fuzz. This is a program that takes random Linux syscalls and throws in random data in random orders. This tool is pretty much a non-stop resource for critical kernel security bugs in Linux. Fuzzing is also a technique used in web application security testing. It's not specific to low level. Importantly, fuzzing should not be looked at as a method to suddenly replace or fix all of your existing software testing. You should instead look at fuzzing as a method to augment your existing tests. In fact, one of the easiest ways to start fuzzing your own code is to adapt existing unit or integration tests, because these are often split into individual harnesses utilizing and testing individual API calls. So these can be turned into fuzz cases with the least amount of effort. But I digress. Fuzzing, like most areas in information security and tech in general, is well discussed online. Most fuzzing research, discussions, talks like this one, tooling and publications can be found freely available. To single out a particular resource, fuzzingbook.org is an amazing resource. It has free detailed walkthroughs of how to implement fuzzers, how the process works, and even touched on more advanced topics such as covered guided fuzzing. In addition, GitLab, the online Git repository, 
who's recently bought both Fuzzit and Peach Fuzzer, aiming to integrate fuzzing into the development lifecycle and starting to implement SDLC on a very wide basis. But I would like to bring this point back. You will get the most mileage out of fuzzing, generally speaking, if you write your own fuzzer. Of course, you can always hire people to do this for you, but understanding how your program works, understanding which parts you can aim to target for the fuzzer is going to give you the most mileage. You will get the best results, you'll find the most bugs if you learn how to learn how to just adapt your tests and start feeding them random data. Just see what happens. Just lastly, I'd just try and like to present some ideas of how fuzzing can be incorporated into typical workflows and how I've seen it done in practice. In a couple of organizations I've worked in, I've seen fuzzing used as Jenkins jobs, as Team City jobs, have it required on Git hooks. Pretty much at any stage in the process, fuzzing can be thrown in as an extra layer of security. Instead of just regression tests or unit tests or integration tests, you can have fuzzing tests. Maybe before you accept code reviews, you'll require proof of evidence that they've thrown that code through at least an X amount of fuzz cases. Yeah, you can even tie it into Jenkins. You can make it <laughs> assign Jira tickets if you want to. There is lots of room to explore this space. With GitLab buying Fuzzit and the Peach Fuzzing Suite, I expect them to be putting out a lot more resources, especially freely available resources, at least for open source projects, on how you can start time fuzzing into your secure development lifecycle projects. And on that note, I'd like to open it up to some questions. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. That was absolutely brilliant, Rory. Um, yeah, we've got uh, a couple of questions that uh, people sent in um, when they registered for this. Um, but if anybody's got any questions um, that they've got now, if they perhaps uh, just type that into the chat, and then we can uh, ask those at the end. Um, but the first question is, is, um, is this and how is this used with uh, other methods um, for, for your purposes for testing, etc.? Well, in the web application security sense, fuzzing is actually incorporated into a lot of the mainstream tools. So tools like Burp Suite and FFUF, GoBuster, and a lot of these other tools can actually use fuzzing methods and do under the hood in order to try and find vulnerabilities. Burp Suite Active Scan is essentially just a fuzzer for web applications. But as I said, writing your own fuzzers in these situations is almost always going to give you better mileage because a generic fuzzer that's not targeted for your application is not going to give you as usable results as one that knows the ins and outs of how your application works. Uh, brilliant. Uh, question just come in. Um, have you found anything uh, by using fuzzing yourself? Um, you know, have you got any examples, any, any stories you can tell? I have actually. Um, Back when I was first getting into this topic, I, I found out about fuzzing by asking how everyone on the, uh, I don't know if this is still a list anymore, full disclosure mailing list <laughs> run by NMAP back in the day. Um, I, I just asked on the list how everyone was finding all these amazing bugs um, when I was about 12. <laughs> and someone replied to it saying, um, most people utilize um, source code analysis and fuzzing techniques. And that got me started on the path. I've since built quite a number of browser fuzzers, um, JavaScript, CSS, and DOM fuzzers was what I started off with. And I found a couple of um, non-critical bugs in Firefox, but I found a good couple of crashing bugs in Firefox and Chrome over the years, but not with security implications. Nowadays, I'm working on more targeted fuzzing of VirtualBox, and I haven't published that research public yet, but soon. Brilliant, fantastic. Uh, Another question, are there any times that you've utilized snapshot fuzzing for targets? Oh, snapshot fuzzing is an amazing topic. I personally, well, it depends if you qualify using LLVM fuzzer or snapshot fuzzing, because that's more in process, so it's not really snapshotting because you're relying on clean state. But um, snapshot fuzzing is an amazing technique. I have looked into it quite a lot, but I haven't used it in a practical sense very much. Um, the person I mentioned earlier, Gamozo Brandon Falk, is pretty much pioneering this space and throwing all his toys out the pram, complaining that 
none of the other fuzzers on the market are good enough. And frankly, he's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how do you know when to stop fuzzing? Uh, this is a good question. Um, this is part of the reason why I'd recommend building your own fuzzer because it's very easy for pretty much anyone to take the public tools like AFL, Hongfuzz, Radamser, and the rest, excuse me, and just throw them against your software, frankly. And it gets to the point where fuzzers can only find a particular subset of the total number of bugs in a program. One fuzzer is never going to find every single bug in a program. So where that particular Wherever that particular point lies will depend on your risk appetite, how important that program is to you, and how much time and compute resources you have to spare, really. Mm -hmm. Generally, incorporating any amount of fuzzing is going to be a, a benefit, but you're going to have to try and figure out how much that impacts every other stage of your development life cycle in order to realize how effective it's going to be and when you should stop. That's a very target-specific question. Hmm. Interesting. And can you and should you use fuzzing for performance testing? Yeah, fuzzing can be used for performance testing as well. Um, it's not security specific fuzz testing. Um, back to what I was saying about the anecdote about people feeding random data and punch cards in the 50s. As I said then, they weren't doing that with security in mind. They're just doing it to check for unexpected behaviour. Fuzzing is a very good tool to check for robustness and program correctness, let alone just finding security bugs. If your program buffs on some input and just crashes, that's one way of doing it. If it takes like 20 minutes to pass another input but doesn't actually crash, that's also something you want to know about. Fuzzing, is, fuzzing and testing in general should be looked at just checking for expected behavior rather than just security sense. Fantastic. Okay, well, unless any uh, questions sneak in. Um, uh, I'll, have, I'll, I'll just come up over here. <laughs> what do I need to start fuzzing? Um, well, uh, you don't really need much. As, as demonstrated in the example we gave earlier, fuzzing can be literally as simple as just piping random data into any given program. And that's fuzzing. You don't necessarily need a powerful machine, you don't need tons of memory, CPU cores, but obviously, generally, the more resources you give, the more bugs and the better mileage you'll get out of it on the other side. It's interesting, uh, speaking about GitLab and fuzzit.io that they recently bought, they were offering fuzzing as a service, which is an interesting concept that hasn't really been explored yet, but there's a lot of movement going on in that space. Oh, brilliant. Okay, well, I think that's uh, that's all the questions we have, Rory. Uh, that's been that's been absolutely brilliant. I've uh, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, if anybody um, is interested, we are running these uh, webinars uh, approximately once a month on varying subjects um, on our security testing and application testing. Uh, we've got some coming up on um, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, etc. Um, you'll find the links to that um, along with this, this video and we'll send those out to you. So um, thank you very much for joining and uh, hopefully we'll see you online soon. Just as another addendum on the end there, um, this video will be up on YouTube and there will be lots of links to all of the resources I've spoken about in the video description. So be sure to come and check it out. Fantastic. Thank you very much everyone for joining. We'll see you soon. Cheers everyone. Thanks for your time.